Ray William Johnson, a name synonymous with success on the internet. But before he carried that weight, he was a college student making political commentary videos on YouTube. This changed when Ray discovered 2009 YouTube's nature was not truly to store an infinitely increasing amount of videos, but instead to promote the viral ones. This discovery allowed Ray to create his most popular, longest running series known as Equals 3. By combining viral videos with his commentary, he both built up his image while taking the rare gems that are viral videos as his own. This strategy and his aggressive growth saw him not only top the YouTube's listings for most subscribers, but also brought on many lows and the stresses that came with it, like a lawsuit, a very public falling out with his network, and because he already reached the peak of success on YouTube, after a five-year run, a departure from his show equals three. Leaving host after unsuccessful host to take his place, Ray's channel saw a steady decline, and when he eventually took control again, it was too late. While his new forms of content did much to promote positive messages, they did very, very little to revitalize a channel that reigned above all others. Now, if this was all that Ray was known for, many might have still loved him. But his rampant abuse of YouTube's copyright system to take down other people's videos is why that is not the case. But he may be making a comeback. Ray has come a long way from being the king of YouTube, and that's why this is a story that's worth telling. The story of the rise and fall of Ray William Johnson. But first, a message from this video's sponsor. Join 6 million others, including myself, by getting Atlas VPN. Upon purchasing, I personally found it nice that you can get protection on unlimited devices. So not just your PC, but also your phone. And when I say protection, I do mean protection. As Atlas both stops ads and malware and notifies you when someone is trying to steal your data. But for other uses besides protection, Atlas VPN is great for finding deals that you may be region locked to as it offers a variety of servers across the globe. And whenever I downloaded it, I found it really easy to use. I had it downloaded and working in like less than 5 minutes. And while I was messing around with the servers, I hopped on a Polish server and went to Netflix and was able to view previously region locked content not available in the US, like Rick and Morty, at an insanely fast connection speed as it offers the best and most affordable deal for just $1.39 per month with 30-day money-back guarantee. So click the link in the description and get the Atlas VPN Black Friday deal for $1.39 a month plus 3 months for free. Add over, back to the video. When looking at the United States National University's ranking list, currently Columbia University falls under number 3. One could even say it equals 3. The importance of this was that this was the college that a 25-year-old Ray William Johnson was attending. Originally from Oklahoma, Ray was now living in Manhattan, attending a big school in a big city that resulted in big bills. And when you're a college student without many reserve funds, you tend to make do with what you have. Unfortunately for Ray, a television was not in his list of luxuries. But a computer was. That computer is what drove him to the internet and YouTube one of many video depository websites that inhabited the internet. But at first, his reason for visiting the website was not for entertainment, but instead for research, as Ray was using YouTube as a tool to find archive videos of old presidential campaigns. This making more sense when it's realized that he was studying US history, as Ray was using this as a stepping stone to eventually go to law school. But as it is for many people, distractions are typical when doing a high concentration activity such as studying. And YouTube, with its enticing titles and thumbnails, promising a quick dose of entertainment made for the perfect distraction. Not unlike how Vine used to operate and how TikTok operates today, browsing through these short viral videos, Ray discovered the earliest form of what we now know as YouTubers. What he found was people recording themselves while discussing their day or sharing stories through video blogs or vlogs. These people, as pioneers to a new craft, lack the same charisma and mannerisms that you might expect from a popular content creator today. As to say that they were trapped in the frame of their camera and had little excitement or charisma to truly capture a large audience. Then again, this was before YouTube partnerships and before people were financially incentivized to make videos. Ray saw these people and thought to himself that he could replicate this style of content but make it a bit more entertaining. 
So with his computer and a borrowed camera, specifically the Canon ZR300 mini DV camcorder by his side, he set out on creating his first YouTube channel sometime in 2007, where he discussed what happened during his day like what he learned in class. This content style for Ray developed an audience of 30 people or so. It should be noted that the name of Ray's original channel is not common knowledge. It's also fairly accepted that it is now gone, instead replaced by a different channel when Ray decided to pursue what he thought would be more engaging comedic content through the feedback of his viewers. So on May 25, 2008, the same year he was diagnosed with general anxiety disorder, the channel Ray William Johnson would share the Capitol Hill Gangsta as another alias was created. On screen is the earliest screenshot available from the Wayback Machine of Ray William Johnson. And if the background of this channel didn't give it away, the titles of the video certainly did that Ray was, as his new form of content, running a political commentary channel where he politically identified as independent and had an emphasis on comedy. Ray also utilized what is now known as clickbait, with titles carrying strong opinions such as, quote, Barack Obama hates white people, unquote, or quote, gay marriage will destroy us all, unquote. To emphasize Ray's intentions, it's understood that this was clickbait as to say he was titling these videos in the most controversial way possible, but in the video would actually oppose the stance the title was taking. Deep dives into the internet sometimes unearth a few of these early, now deleted videos. The earliest being episode 3, quote, Rachel Ray hates America, unquote. Anyone's a terrorist. It's Dunkin' Donuts. Have you tried their sausage, egg, and cheese croissant? That's a suicide bomb in the form of a sandwich if I've ever seen one. <laughs> and of course now, Dunkin' Donuts will be forced to change their popular slogan. The new one should be something like, Death to America runs on Dunkin'. This video gives us the first peek of many things, like his editing style, comedic delivery, and commentary style, all with his New York apartment in the background. It's immediately clear that Ray not only had a more active commentary style, but a unique one that took significantly more effort, writing, and research. More smaller vlog channels had the content creator ramble about their day with little clear thought or even interest in their own story, monologuing without a break in footage. Ray took it upon himself to record one or several lines, change position, record the next line, move the camera, and repeat all while putting much visible effort to deliver each line with the appropriate emotion and reaction. The end result was him bouncing about all over the place, adding much motion and therefore an extra layer of captivity that few developing YouTubers had. In short, Ray was entertaining and had an immediate sense of charisma and he appeared comfortable on camera. This is something that takes the average content creator years to refine, but Ray had it almost immediately. Fast forward to a little over two weeks time, starting June 14th, 2008, his subscribers more than doubled, which isn't very significant being that it was only around a 40 subscriber increase. What was significant was that his videos, that used to average around 400 views per upload, were now averaging around 800 views per upload, some breaking a thousand. This was helped by the fact that he was consistent and uploaded around twice a week. Now, two months later, with Ray sticking to this format, things started to pick up when he tripled his sub count and videos started averaging 2,000 views. And by December 8, he had around 6,000 subscribers, meaning Ray became a large channel. At least relative to other YouTube channels at the time, proven by the fact that on most days, he was on the top 100 most viewed comedy-based channels. Other notable changes includes upgrades in hardware and software. Hardware like a new pricier camera and software like changing from Windows Movie Maker to Adobe Premiere. Other significant changes and additions include custom thumbnails for his videos that usually had the letter G for the Gangsta and Capitol Hill Gangsta set as a way for his viewers to more easily recognize one of his videos. He even started monetizing his channel by selling merchandise. But on closer inspection, it's revealed that it is not Capitol Hill Gangster merchandise, it was instead a symbol of an equal sign and a three. Even his logo was changed to equals three, which is not fully addressed until the following year on February 24th, 2009, where any reference, except older thumbnails, were stripped of his previous alias and now promptly promoted equals three. Not only did his new thumbnails correctly portray this, but were also seemingly fully created in Microsoft Paint. And the titles became even more ambiguous like, Wanna get high, your perverted dad, or did you lose? 
After enough backlash from the change, Ray decided to address it in a video. Now normally this show evolves based on your feedback, but this time I can't do it. I'm not changing the name back. But give it time, the name will work in favor of the show. Trust me. Now judging from the feedback I got, you guys hate the new name. You were pissed. Some of you thought the new name was more disappointing than when Penelope Cruz won that Oscar. Booyah! Some of you even threatened to cut one of my nuts off. Then I'd have to change the logo to something like this. This video, while acknowledging the change in name, did little to explain why it was done or what equals three meant. Many theories can explain the new channel logo. Most obviously, equals three is an old style emoji that represents a cat's face. It could also be male genitalia as Ray was making reference to in his video. Or, as his future episode showed, he covered three topics for video, so each video equals three. But the purpose of showing that clip was not purely for Ray to address the name change, but for this specific segment where Ray talks about the evolution of the show based on viewers' feedback. Which, as we later find out, means that Ray saw Equals 3 as a opportunity to format his content to become a show on YouTube that followed a strict upload schedule. As per his channel's description, Ray was now covering celebrity humor, which has a wider audience than political commentary. Ray was trying to fine-tune a series that most people on YouTube might be interested in watching, and was experimenting with different topics to see what connected most with a wider YouTube user base. And it was working. In just nine months, Ray went from creating this channel to averaging around 30,000 views per video, which in today's age is quite decent to average. But back then, it meant that while he was not one of the largest channels, he was still very large and influential. This was due to change when Ray, instead of focusing on popular stories on the internet or politics, he showcased another channel's clips, and to his surprise, it was well received. That's when he started experimenting a bit more and selected more videos to showcase. Following the pattern of one video discussed per upload with two other separate discussions. For example, sometimes he discussed some fan drama on his Facebook page in a way to promote it. Something else he did with fans is he allowed fans to record a question of the day for his videos. Kooky665, and he said, Alright, say you just got a million dollars from the lottery or something. What would you spend it on and why? Yeah. Yeah, I guess he said it all. If you had a million dollars, how would you spend it and why would you spend it that way? It's speculated that this did two major things that helped boost his videos in the old style YouTube algorithm. First is that YouTube had a feature that allowed users to post a video response to nearly any person's video, so his viewers were creating videos that would also be associated with his channel, providing him not a lot, but still a decent amount of promotion. The second, and most important, is the question of the day prompted viewers to answer and therefore comment on his channel, which increases engagement noticeably. It's a practice that you find many channels doing today. And whatever the intention, at least back then, it was understood that increased engagement, whether a viewer watched the video for a longer amount of time or left a comment, the more likely YouTube was to promote it in the search or suggested videos. Another thing that greatly started impacting his channel was his attempt at now truly, consistently uploading videos aiming for two videos a week. And when you have a set schedule, online viewers tend to adapt that into their own lives and make it a habit to watch you more often. Before, where he was covering one video a day, he was now covering two and sticking to the ones that were somewhat viral. Though everything prior helped build up his online presence and guided him closer to ever more popular forms of content, there was no month as crucial as May 2009. Because first and foremost, he finally found his golden goose. He stripped away politics, fan dramas, and other forms of drama and started uploading content that covered three viral videos and one fan question. This change began exactly on May 8, 2009 when he uploaded I Will End You, which is also the earliest video you can find on his channel as of today because any of the earlier ones have been deleted. So this new style of video, at its core, is what Ray William Johnson was and is known for. While videos years later might have a different background, better equipment, or have a slightly different style, from this point on, this is what people would expect when visiting his channel. Three viral videos and a question of the day. It was now practically set in stone. Needless to say, this is when his channel really started taking off. 
But before we get into that, we'll discuss why this performed the way it did. YouTube back then, as it is for some now, was mainly used as a host for viral videos. Of course, there were content creators like Fred or Shane Dawson that people visited the site regularly for, but the main draw for the average person was the short, digestible, universally understood viral video. Before YouTube, that's why things like America's Funniest Home Videos did so well. They showcased these short, addicting videos. More modern renditions can include Ridiculousness or Tosh.0, where the content revolves around showcasing these. So we've established that YouTube was mainly used for this. So when Ray took these, he expanded his audience widely. Because viral videos are rare gems. Rarely will you see a channel succeed after that one hit wonder. But what if you had a channel that had two to three of these bi-weekly? Not just that, but had an understanding of what people wanted to watch and also cut them down to the most interesting parts. No need to search for your short endorphin delivering content. Just watch Ray William Johnson and he'll give you your bi-weekly dose of what you're looking for. But that bi-weekly schedule was not the easiest to uphold because college kept him very busy. That end, he was still prone to experimentation, as he was developing his own website and linked various other social medias. But he also was attempting to develop other channels. That's when he created a channel with other associates known as Fatty Spins on May 17th, 2009. This was used to host songs and the music videos that went along with it. More famously, or rather now infamously, known is the Doing Your Mom song. Doing your mom! Do it, do it, your mom. Which was not uploaded to Fatty Spins, but rather his main channel on July 1st, 2009. Possibly because he liked it so much and his viewers did too, it was also used as the outro song for his videos. As for the results of this change in content, in around a month and a half, from early June to late July, he doubled in subscribers and tripled in average views per video. Next month brought the same results, with both numbers being doubled. But the month of August brought on something a bit different. His first, very own, viral video that hit 2.6 million views in just a week's time. A large contributor of this was most likely the change in thumbnail. Instead of using Microsoft Paint, he selected one of the interesting frames of the video. And as Ray has done previously, he adapted this to all his videos. Another change in the videos is that he had a different background because he moved into a new apartment with another YouTuber known as The Will of DC. As for the background, those are pages from the 1986 comic book, Watchmen. With Ray being a connoisseur of comics and other forms of graphic novels, even set the background of his YouTube page to Batman. You see, one of Ray's primary forms of entertainment growing up was reading comic books. Not only did he enjoy reading them, but also illustrated his own scenarios. Even in adulthood, Ray maintained close ties to comics and was a cartoonist for his school's newspaper his freshman year. Going back to his channel and moving on to the next months, while the results lay similar to the months prior in doubling in average views, there was an even more significant aspect about the month of September. And that was, he was finally hitting the front page of YouTube. This is a very significant development in his growth. Because unlike today, the front page of YouTube was not necessarily based on promoting safer forms of content as it is now, it was more of YouTube promoting a mix of its most successful channels alongside viral and few niche videos. So if you were a large, established channel and posted consistently, you and other similar channels had a monopoly on the front page. As when your video first appears on there, it will bring in many viewers and potential subscribers alike and boost your viewership. This then increasing the amount of people watching your old and newer videos and therefore raises the chances of you popping on the front page once more. To further prove this, we can look almost two months ahead on November 10th, where you will see no Ray William Johnson. But the following day, November 11th, one of his videos with significantly smaller viewership is being promoted. Five days later again, he's on the front page with a video that has even less viewership than the prior one. So now even his less popular videos are being promoted to anyone entering the website. And this change was more than notable. On August 31st, he had around 115,000 subscribers and averaged 30,000 views per video. But now going exactly four months later to December 31st, he was sitting at around 546,000 subscribers and now averaging well over a million views per video. 
So in a year's time, he went from practically not existing in the YouTube community to being the 16th most subscribed channel on YouTube. While this was a massive achievement within itself, Ray was still some distance from the top. And as he did, he still experimented and tried to find other successful formats. It was ultimately this habit that brought him to where he is now. And what a better way to experiment on YouTube than to start a second channel. This channel, created on January 11, 2010, was known as Breaking NYC, a channel meant to host his nearly daily vlogs. This, of course, added more stress to his noisy schedule, because as Ray mentions in a later vlog, creating equals three is an endeavor that takes up an entire day, or rather 12 hours of his day every Sunday and Wednesday. Entire day making an equals three episode, and it literally takes me from the time I get up in the morning to late at night to upload. I have to edit, I have to film, I have to go through all of the response videos. By then I've usually read all the comments, but uh, yeah, making an episode is an all-day process. That's why they come out so late. This consists of writing, filming, editing, and trying to read every comment in his recent videos. In more extreme cases, he'd delegate both the editing and reading of the comments to his roommate, The Well of DC. Outside of YouTube, Ray was still attending school, going to the gym, and maintaining a busy social life. But still, this was not enough. Ray sought out other forms of expansion. While he rejected sponsorships, as the general sentiment on content creators having sponsorships was not normalized back then, he still sought entirely new mediums to expand with. One of these was a Farmville-esque game set around his most well-known song, Doing Your Mom. You pitched this to me, and it, it, was a, it was an amazing, incredible idea, and it really intrigued me. The Doing Your Mom video game. Yeah! <laughs> it's all about the video game, man. <laughs> like, I know that sounds silly, but Farmville, as dumb as that is, is incredibly popular. So what about a, a video game of infinite leveling up, but instead of building your farm, going around the neighborhood doing moms? Though this truly never got beyond its conceptual stage, it's worth noting this to show how proud Ray was of this song. On the topic of this song, or rather Ray's band that performed it, Fatty Spins, while Ray's viewers love their songs and requested more music from them, Ray in a vlog explains that the band dissolved because the two other band members were arguing over royalties. And to appease them, Ray gave his share of the profit from the Doing Your Mom song from iTunes to them in order to avoid them suing each other, thus ending the short run of Fatty Spins. But the Doing Your Mom song had many problems in its development beyond effectively dismantling their band as it initially had many delays because they couldn't find someone to mix it in a timely manner. In fact, this song was almost never released due to just that, until one of the band members decided to mix it himself after Ray, frustrated with the issues with the song, wanted to give up on the project entirely. While Fatty Spins no longer exists, shortly after the breakup, Fatty Spins 2 was created re-releasing previously deleted songs with a band member who mixed the first song and effectively saved the project, claiming ownership of the channel and potentially keeping the profit of it. Staying on the topic of revenue, according to Retro King Ching, whose previous channel was for fun 808 was a friend of Ray's several years back, Ray emailed YouTube asking to be removed from the partnership program. This is the program that allows him to make money from his videos. But Ray was becoming fed up with the many not-so-well-known copyright claims and DMCAs on his videos. Also, the bigger Ray got and the more videos he made, the potential for one of the owners of a viral video to strike Ray's channel for using their content increased. But according to Retro King Ching, YouTube never read or reacted to the email which largely benefited Ray as his channel no doubt supplied him with much money. As for the copyright claims, the thing about race content, it's arguable that it doesn't always fall under fair use, as to say his comments on viral videos hardly transform them and serve little more to showcase the heart of the video than to analyze or criticize the content. And in a case like that, it could be taken to court and if it's found that his videos is competing with the original viral video, he could stand to lose a lot of money. So again, the more successful he was and the more he uploaded, the more these claims hit his channel. To say he was an easy target for copyright claims is an understatement. Especially when he passed 1 million subscribers on March 19th, 2010. 
which at that point, there only existed 5 other channels with a million subs or more. With his success, he was invited to various gatherings and given many business opportunities of the like, flying out to Los Angeles several times in 2010 to attend business meetings. These business meetings usually pertaining to trying to give companies insight on how to join the YouTube sphere. Also, during one of his 2010 vlogs, he mentions going back to LA to meet a managing company, meeting a network. Looks like I'm gonna be going back to LA in like a week or two. Some company's flying me up there because they want to do some deal, they want to manage me or something. I don't know, that shit never, that shit always falls through, so we will see if they have good things to say or not. A month later, the Your Favorite Martian channel, a channel created way back on November 30th, 2006, received its seemingly first upload. A one minute teaser that states, be patient. As we'll find out later, Maker, the network in question, succeeded in recruiting Ray and would go to fund his projects including paying staff to help produce Equals 3 and Your Favorite Martian for a cut of the profit. With Ray's size, especially now by the end of the year, he was a sound investment. To emphasize Ray's size, taking a look at the screenshot of the most subscribed channels on December 9, 2010, Ray was second, surpassed only by Niga Higa, who had around half a million subscribers more than him. But that wasn't for long, because 2011 for Ray was a very successful year. Not only did Your Favorite Martian start getting a lot of traction as the year progressed, but also Ray helped develop another channel known as Igual a Tres, which is a Spanish equivalent to Equals 3. Though this channel never got much traction, it's still interesting to see in what ways Ray decided to expand but some business decisions were a bit bigger than, let's say, making another channel. Big, like moving from New York to Los Angeles, which is a typical move for internet personalities as Los Angeles has both much talent available for collaboration and has many resources for entertainment. This is something he announced on April 1st, 2011 through his Breaking NYC vlog channel that was rebranded as Breaking LA. Actually that uh, I've moved cities, I now live in Los Angeles. Another notable happening this year was halfway through it, on June 28, 2011, Ray passed Nigahiga and became the most subscribed YouTuber of all time. It's arguable that Ray was a well-known person at this time, even outside of YouTube. He was an internet celebrity transitioning to levels of fame beyond that. With this growth, title, and his association with Maker, he was able to meet many traditional celebrities, even having some host equals three while he was gone in the later months of 2011 and the earlier months of 2012. This list of celebrities include, but is not limited to, Sarah Silverman, Zac Efron, Jay and Silent Bob, Jason Biggs, Ed Helms, Gabriel Iglesias, Riza, Nick Kroll, Danny DeVito, Kian Peel, Kristen Bell, TJ Miller, Bobby Lee, Andy Milanakis, Margaret Cho, Garfunkel Notes, Paul Shear, John Cho, Cal Penn, Romney Malco, and most importantly, Robin Williams, who cameoed in November of 2011. While Ray did reach other milestones that month, like allegedly being the first YouTuber to hit 5 million subscribers, the most impactful to him was meeting Robin Williams. As for how this happened, Robin Williams was on a press junket for Happy Feet 2, which was releasing on November 18th. With this, various traditional, and now, what was irregular at the time, they also invited prominent members of the social media community. As Ray later stated, the most impactful part of the interview to Ray was not their discussion about the movie, or the collaboration with Equals 3. It was that Robin Williams told Ray that he was a fan of what he was doing and was very happy to see what he built essentially from nothing. But most importantly, he told Ray that he was going to make it. Meaning that he was bound to find continuous success in whatever he did. As a fan of Robin Williams, this meant a lot to Ray. Nearly closing off 2011 as a great year. That was until December 3rd when according to a slew of videos reporting on it, Ray's channel, for a short period, was suspended for the perpetual problem of copyright claims against it before it was shortly brought back up. 
While the following year, 2012, was successful on paper because he was still averaging around 5 million views per video and growing tremendously on both Equals 3 and Your Favorite Martian, it was the war declared on him that was one of, if not the largest, providers of stress for him that year, coming from none other than his own network. To provide more context, back in 2012, Maker Studios surpassed Machinima and became the largest independent YouTube network. Their growth, and therefore success, inspired large investments. The largest and leading, at least in September of 2012, was Time Warner. As Ray later described, they are a very traditional company, and traditional companies like to own the intellectual properties they get revenue from. The problem begins when they discover Maker does not own Equals 3 and only own half of your favorite Martian. Sure, they get a cut of the profits, but they don't truly own the content. Maker's response to this, most likely influenced by Time Warner, was asking Ray to hand over a large percentage of his intellectual property. Ray Unsure asked for a term sheet that would describe their partnership going forward. So to point out the largest problems in this term sheet was that they were asking for 40% of Ray's revenue from his channel, its future use in television, and revenue from any joint IP like Your Favorite Martian. But the issues don't stop there. To summarize this portion, they're now asking for joint ownership of Equals 3. In return, Ray would not receive much. Maybe some better advertisements for his channel, but overall it's not difficult to see that the deal was quite one-sided. And because of that, Ray declined these terms. From here, things continued to devolve. When Danny Zappin, the CEO and co-founder of Maker Studios, threatened to shut down all production for Your Favorite Martian and Equals 3. Equals 3 at the time allegedly having staff 12 people. While they could shut down Your Favorite Martian because it was a joint property, they could not shut down Equals 3, just unstaff it. And doing so would be a major loss in revenue, which is what Ray responded with. But this bluff didn't work, as Maker decided to pull all the resources from Equals 3 and shut down Your Favorite Martian. But Ray, as he's done in the past, could handle the load of Equals 3 on his own, and began filming it in his apartment where he also explained the massive shift in technical quality and that Equals 3 in the future would no longer be part of Maker Studios, implying that he is leaving them and would not back down from making content. What's up guys? You're gonna notice a few things are different. One, I haven't shaved in a while. Let me take care of that. Okay, so two, I'm filming this episode from my apartment. Now in the near future, Equals 3 will no longer be part of the Maker Studios network, so I'm gonna film here for a while. Even if I don't have the proper equipment at home, if, you know what, even if I have to film butt ass naked in a back alley, you guys are getting an episode got. Maker Studios did not react well to Ray's defiance. In response, they submitted an arguably passive aggressive press release to news media rock stars stating this, quote, Ray is still part of the Maker network. With the recent decline in viewership on Equals 3, it made sense for him to go back to producing the show himself. Maker providing a full production staff of 12 people including a team of writers no longer was a viable option for Equals 3. Maker fully supports Ray's decision to go back to producing the show on his own for the time being and we wish him continued success. We will continue to support Ray through this transition." Unquote. But things still get worse from here. With Maker making it look like Equals 3 was failing and it was no longer a sound investment, Ray's social media started erupting in comments asking him what happened. With a bit of back and forth and a decline in relations between Maker and Ray, a month later led to a termination with their contract. This severing of ties started the climax of this situation when Ray wrote an op-ed and submitted it to news media rock stars, along with pictures of Maker's requested terms that started it all. This 1,319 word op-ed has much to cover, so we'll do it quickly. Ray starting it off saying that he should have done this immediately but that he tends to avoid internet beef and that he is not malicious towards anyone. But Maker Studios has backed him into a corner. He goes on to say that the first red flag was when he claims that Danny Zappin, the CEO of Maker, admitted to him that he was a convicted felon and once his record was expunged, he would become the official CEO of Maker. Ray goes on to mention that Maker renegotiated the contract 8 months before its expiration to take a bigger cut of revenue from Equals 3. 
which Ray, though reluctant, was willing to seize the new terms, which is when he learned about them wanting joint ownership of Equals 3. After declining, they gave him two other term sheets, which Ray also disagreed to. This catches us up to where we are now. A new piece of information, however, is that Ray disclosed that Danny Zappin, according to Ray, stated, quote, I won't hold your YouTube channel slash AdSense account in our network against your will. We will give it back to you, unquote. To oversimplify what an AdSense account is, it's your Google account that holds the revenue you make from ads on YouTube. Though Danny Zappin claims they were going to give it back, Ray claims they were not making any efforts to do so. Also, as Ray claims, they were holding it as leverage for him to, quote, sign over all of your favorite Martians intellectual property, void my stock options in the company, sign a confidentiality agreement to never tell the truth, and are even suggesting that they have legal claims against me for trade libel, slander, etc., unquote. This is all backed by this email. He then goes on to denounce networks and again goes on to claim that Danny Zappin is a convicted felon. Shortly after Ray's op-ed was posted, it only took a couple of hours for Danny Zappin to text Ray, your lack of integrity and character are sad. Fuck you. Prepare for war, bitch. Which Ray, like the new terms and emails, also posted to his social medias. And when it came out that a CEO of a company backed by Time Warner was threatening a content creator, the traditional media stepped in and started covering the story as well. Whether the decision was influenced by this controversy or not, around four months later in 2013, Zappin stepped down as CEO of Maker and later sued for a breach of contract in the sense that they made him step down. But this video is focusing on Ray William Johnson and not Danny Zappin, so we'll refocus to him. Back to the end of 2012, right before the drama between Maker and Ray blew up, according to news media Rockstars, the same website Ray gave his op-ed to, Ray was starting a new production company, Runaway Planet, also working with his girlfriend and YouTuber, Anna Akana. To expand more on Anna and her relationship with Ray, many sources claim different points of when their relationship officially started. Some say as earliest as 2011, and many others unanimously say March 1st, 2013. Whichever the case, the commonality is that they were dating, and alongside their relationship, they began running a YouTube channel together also known as Runaway Planet. This channel primarily uploaded vlogs with the two main hosts discussing various topics. This format is also very similar to a podcast, which it later developed into. But that is hardly the end of their endeavors. By the end of next year, specifically December 2013, Ray and Anna's production studio, Runaway Machine, formerly known as Runaway Planet, created and released its first web series, Riley Rewind, starring none other than Anna Akana playing Riley a high school student with the power to rewind time. With Ray playing a small role alongside producing the show, allowed him to get more experience with traditional media, which also helps because he sold the rights to a television show earlier that year. As for Riley Rewind, which was originally a Facebook exclusive, it was uploaded to Ray's channel. The end result was a series that's quality might be interchangeable with a television show. It's also considered to be one of the best, if not the best, web show of that year. But where television brings in a wealth of high-end advertisements and a wealth of viewers, Riley Rewind did not. This five-episode series, while still getting a large number of views relative to the average YouTube video, performed well. But relative to Ray's regular uploads that take much less time and effort to produce, they did poorly. With each episode of Riley Rewind averaging one-third of the views that Ray's typical videos got, at least on YouTube. But that wouldn't be long because 2014 for him or his channel was not a good year. For starters, where he used to upload several times a week in 2013, by the beginning of 2014 he began with posting only once a week, then bi-monthly until he uploaded, thank you for everything. But the final retitling that did away with the ambiguity is now Ray William Johnson retires from the Equals 3 show, which clearly describes the contents of that video. To summarize it, Ray, with having done Equals 3 for the past five years, no longer felt creatively fulfilled. And actually, he hardly felt creatively fulfilled with anything he's done on the internet in that time, as the end result was always success. 
Even years prior, he always knew that he wanted to leave Equals 3 to move on to something bigger, which is standard for most content creators. Why am I quitting? Well, I'm glad you asked, handsome stranger. Well, the short answer is I've been making internet videos as a hobby for a long time, and I feel like I've outgrown it. Like, I've written more jokes about viral videos than any one human should ever have to write. So why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this to illustrate that I feel like I've done everything cool that there is to do in this medium, and I've had a ton of success, and it no longer feels gratifying. Yeah, I know. It makes me sound like a spoiled bitch. And I'm going to be really candid here and say this. I'm the kind of person who has to keep moving forward and has to keep being creative or I get depressed. I'm just being 100% honest here. Like this show isn't fulfilling me creatively anymore and I have to move on. Okay, so let's get to it. So what is the fate of Equals 3, the show? Well, originally I wanted to retire the show completely. It's actually still what I want, but I've gotten so much pushback from you guys and people around me that I'm gonna try to keep the show going. But here's the dildo. In order to do that, I'm gonna have to hire a new host, which means that I'm gonna have to shut the show down completely for about a month or two while I cast this new host. I just want it to be someone who's really good, someone who you guys will really like and connect with, and ideally, someone who hosts the show better than me. Oh, anyone can host it better than you. Shut up. So what do you think? You think you could be the host? You think you got it what it takes? Psh, psh. As creators go through these cycles of wanting to do something different, whether for the potential of even more success, boredom, altruism, or all the above, which is most likely what Ray is going through. But as Ray explained, this wasn't an end to Equals 3. You see, back on December 30th, 2013, Ray announced on Twitter that Equals 3 was going to be retired as Ray was going to focus on other aspects of his career. Due to protests from fans and before Equals 3's hiatus, Ray decided that he was going to start casting for another host of the show to keep it going, but this was allegedly set back by a movie that he was set to play a large role in. An independent movie that released in 2016 known as Who's Driving Doug. But before we delve into Ray's theatrical career, there's still much more to cover in 2014. Specifically relationships. But romantic relationships for many come and go. Other relationships bonded by blood tend to be the longest lasting. And whether it's a good or bad thing, most are quite impactful. In Ray's case, it was his father who was diagnosed with late stage cancer. But Ray's father, by many standards, was not a good person. He, as Ray stated, was an abusive drunk that did little to maintain healthy relationships with those that cared about him. To provide an example, when Ray was 17 years old, his father had been, for the most part, out of his life. But at 17, Ray's father forged Ray's signature and ran off with his college fund. This straw that broke the camel's back was what made Ray decide to never see him again. And he never did, leaving his father to pass a month after Ray learned of his diagnosis. These many life-changing events happening in such a short period changed Ray's outlook on life. From then on, he decided that, unlike his father, he was going to better himself to be able to maintain relationships with those close to him. But the results of this wouldn't come to fruition until several years later. As for the rest of 2014 and what other projects Ray was moving towards, he played a small role in the Fluffy movie and started to work on various other films, whether as an actor or executive producer. A lesser known creation is his graphic novel, going by Robot Clown Mob, which sold out in the first day of its release. While his new endeavors may have stated his need for a creative outlet, his old ones, specifically Equals 3, did little but bring him stress, which was after its relaunching, supported by a cameo of Jenna Marbles. Thanks, Jenna. I'm Robbie Motts, and you don't know me yet. I've done some theater and some improv, but I'm just a guy who auditioned. I auditioned and apparently Ray liked me the best out of like a thousand people, so I get to do this which is incredible. And after the casting for the show was complete, which was a little over four months since Ray's departure, its new host, out of an alleged thousand auditions, was handpicked by Ray. This person is Robbie Motts, who did a great job to win over Equals 3's audience after a shaky start. But this was hardly the source of the stress. That came from Jukin Media. Because starting on May 1st, 2014, they copyright claimed 41 of Ray's videos. And in order to get the revenue back, Ray has to dispute the videos three at a time. And if it's disputed and Jukin decides not to let go of the claim, which they didn't, it gets taken down by a DMCA. It takes just three DMCAs to get a channel banned from YouTube. 
so Ray could only dispute three at a time without having his channel banned. He had three choices here. First, pay Jukin's licensing fee in order to use the videos without fear of them being claimed. Second, keep disputing claims to slowly get the videos back up. And the final choice is to file a lawsuit against Jukin to stop them from taking down more videos. That's when Ray and his company went on the offensive and sued Jukin Media. And so began Equals 3 Productions vs Jukin Media. It should be mentioned that the importance of cases like these extend far beyond the participants because the internet and its relationship with fair use is still relatively new and the outcome of this could change the landscape on YouTube. If Ray succeeds, it could deter more companies from striking other creators' videos whether legitimate or not. But if he loses, it will only give these companies more confidence to strike more channels. But as is the nature of lawsuits, they take a fair amount of time to come to a conclusion. But what if he lost? Would that mean the end of his channel or, or better yet, his content style? It may have been this intrusive thought that now in 2015 propelled them to come back to his channel though only partially to develop other forms of content that were not centered on showcasing viral videos like his skip based series known as Boo's Lightyear the generic top six lists and other experimental shows, which took a variety of new talent to join a new era of Equals 3. It should also be mentioned that since Ray in large part left, the views were gradually dropping, going from 4 million to 2 million per video from the start and end of 2014 respectively, to 1.5 million to 500,000 views by the start and end of 2015 respectively. Then again, there were far more significant things happening than a decrease in views or the fact that Ray was an executive producer for a movie that you can find on Netflix. It was that, after a year-long battle, on October 13, 2015, Judge Stephen V. Wilson of the U.S. District Court for the Central District of California wrote, Quote, equals three use of Jukin's videos is admittedly commercial. Nevertheless, the commercial nature of the use is outweighed by the episode's transformativeness. Unquote. The reason why the judge stated that was because Jukin filed a motion for summary judgment that Equals 3's videos did not fall under fair use, or rather they couldn't use fair use as a defense. But after a review, it was denied. So out of 18 videos, which used 19 of Jukin's licensed videos, there was only one that the judge did not consider fair use, which was a video of a man dropping a newly released iPhone 6. And because the comments were so general and lacked parody or criticism, it was less likely to fall under fair use. But it was that one clip, that instance, that small ruling in favor of Jukin that gave them the confidence that they needed to keep pursuing this case. And because the judge didn't throw the case out, there wasn't an obvious victor. So now it's going to trial to be decided by a jury. This seemingly added 21 videos to be examined for fair use, and according to The Hollywood Reporter in March of 2016, an anonymous juror stated, quote, The jury came back with a unanimous no for each count. No fair use. We just didn't feel that the videos were transformative enough to count for fair use. While the final verdict, according to The Hollywood Reporter, is under seal, there is still, based on what the jury seems to believe, an impossibly small chance that Ray could win. As a standard for cases like these, they settled out of court. So while an attempt was made, Ray came back to a disappointed internet as he was unable to win this very important case. But the truth is, this is a bit of an exaggeration as not many people were even keeping up with this trial. What they were keeping up with, however, was how often Equals 3 was transitioning hosts. As in 2015, Robbie Motts, the host Ray Han selected for Equals 3 after his one-year contract expired and had a discussion with Ray, decided that he wanted to seek out different things in life. This is where Kaja Martin comes in. Kaja was Ray's assistant in 2011, who after their time together became a business partner, and was voted in by fans as the new host of Equals 3. But just as they did to Robbie, they didn't accept her right away. Many people saying that Carlos, a comedian Ray met years prior, should have won the vote. These stresses that the new hosts incur are not easy to process, as viewers on any given platform can and will react negatively to any change. And a change in a host is a major change. So just five months later, Equals 3 transitioned host for the last time, this time with Carlos taking the reins. 
this entire process hurting their channel more and more as time went on. Because as much as people tuned in for the viral videos, they also tuned in for Ray because they established a parasocial relationship with him. Then, when they were beginning to establish a parasocial relationship with Robbie, he left. The same thing happened with Kaja and Carlos. It's safe to say that this constant switching was both unpleasant for the host and for the audience. To summarize, Hose didn't stick around long enough to build a strong connection with the audience or have the audience understand and appreciate the repertoire. Equals 3 lacked the consistency it used to have, and lack of consistency will kill any channel. And in fact, at several points, Ray had disabled the like to dislike bar because the hate towards him and the host were getting so bad. This downward trend in views and support is likely why Equals 3 Studios, on May 11, 2016, began their break from filming. One that, as time passed, solidified its permanence. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. I'm Carlos, y yo apruebo este mensaje. Also, guys, we're gonna take uh, we're gonna take a little production break. Okay, I'm gonna do some traveling. While Ray did upload other forms of media consistently through his various social media networks in the forms of skits, and took part in even more traditional areas of entertainment and advertising, like a pizza commercial, his YouTube channel lay long neglected. That was until, over a year after his most recent visible video, he uploaded the first episode of a new vlog series that had a new entry once or a few times a month, introducing much of his YouTube audience to his girlfriend Kelly, who was celebrating her one-year anniversary with Ray. This series also introduced fans to his developing stand-up career, a deeper look into his friendships and lifestyle, and finally, unexpected problems in his life. Like when on September 17th, 2017, while on tour, Ray finds out that his apartment building caught fire. My neighbor's apartment burnt down and part of mine caught fire and now uh, I guess I have to live with Red Kelly for a while. And when the firemen assessed the damage, the good news was the majority of his possessions were unharmed. But the bad news was that there's a gaping hole in his kitchen that peers into his neighbor's charred apartment, and the only choice left is to condemn the building, coaxing Ray to move in with his girlfriend who readily took him in. Then exactly three months later on December 17th, wildfires were ravaging California while Ray was again on tour. There was an evacuation order in the vicinity of Kelly and his apartment. Though the fire never reached them, the stress of it did. So when I get back to LA, I may have no apartment again. Well, that's not good. Uh, I think more importantly, I'm worried about Kelly and the cats. And if she has to move them out of the apartment, they're gonna freak out because they're cats and that's just what cats do. Nevertheless, by the end of 2017, Ray stated that it was one of the best years of his life. As he said, he was reaching a point where views and other analytics mattered less to him. An interesting observation is that Ray, no longer reviewing viral videos, was revisiting other forms of content that he long abandoned, like his vlogs, his music with his new band Fat Damon, and the lesser-known podcast that went under Kings of Influence. But by late 2019, all these projects were eventually abandoned. There were a few other changes that happened around this time, like him changing his channel name to Ray and also hiding his sub count, both of which have been reverted. Still staying in late 2019, Ray started up a new series based on the ideas that came back to him in 2014. The same year, he stopped hosting Equals 3 and the same year his father passed. This new series was known as Superhuman with a V in place of the U and Super. What this was, was a series initially airing on Facebook of motivational slash self-improvement videos, meaning that Ray felt that he finally got into a place where he had improved enough that he could now share how to improve with others. This to him was a form of altruism because at this time, helping others came first and views came second or maybe even third, or so he says. Typically, when holding such a position or ideology, that person tends to avoid conflict or at least things that can get them into more controversies. And Ray had his seemingly largest controversy, at least in most recent time, at the beginning of 2019, when a relatively small 50,000 subscriber YouTube channel known as Hoover uploaded Ray William Johnson Things He Can Sing. 
That was a fucking bar. You hear that? This, I don't know how to feel is, about this. This isn't as bad. Like, this seems like he's, like, genuinely trying, but he's just, like, he's just starting out. But the, the, Here's the thing. It's like, years. he can pull good songs if if they weren't filled with fucking uh, Easter eggs or some shit. Easter eggs? Like, yeah, like, fucking, who the fuck is Andy? What what the hell is his name? Fred Astaire. Oh, I uh, dare. It's literally the name of the song. This video is a commentary and criticism video that, along with Hoover, had two of his associates, Wild Spartans and Quackity, creators that have their own sizable following, watching snippets of Ray's old and new music, pointing out how some of the songs didn't age so well, but also their appreciation of some classic tracks. So how did this video create so much controversy for Ray? Well, that's because people didn't watch it. Or rather, they couldn't watch it. Because Ray, or an employee of his, as seen through Hoover's Twitter, not only did they copyright claim and block the parts that included Ray's music, but they also claimed the sections where Hoover and friends were talking amongst each other with no intellectual property of Ray's present. How we know this is that Ray, or an employee of his, claimed the entirety of the video to be his intellectual property. This is very strange for many reasons. Like Ray's previous lawsuit where he fought for fair use, or the fact that Equals 3 was largely based on using others' viral videos. In order to do such things, you most likely have to have a pretty good grasp as to what fair use and copyright is. So Ray would know that criticism and parody are protected by fair use. But this isn't an isolated case on YouTube as there are many unhinged, infamous creators that target videos discussing them usually because they want to silence their criticism, and when that happens, it triggers the Streisand effect and it gets more popular. It brings up questions like, what was so terrible about the video that it was taken down? What was the criticized creator wanting to hide? Immediately, due to Ray's content cockblock, which is one of the sins of the internet, and because Hoover was well-connected with other decently-sized content creators, this story started to spread rapidly. Actually, the day it was taken down, there was already a hashtag started on Twitter. Hashtag Ray William Johnson is over party. The following day, Hoover uploaded a video talking about how the entirety of his video was claimed, along with beckoning Ray to reach out to him so that the video can be restored. So I'm like, alright, let's just see how the video's doing. But then as I'm about to go check, I get a bunch of tweets from people saying, oh, I can't watch your video. I'm like, oh, okay, maybe it's a YouTube glitch. Maybe it's just privated when it should be public. I mean, YouTube fucks up all the time. I can understand YouTube fucking up again. But no, it's not that. Ray William Johnson himself, I'm pretty sure, took down the fucking video. Now, I have no idea why he did, but I checked the claim. He claimed the entire video. I'm pretty sure he's gonna watch this video because I don't know what I'm gonna title it. It'd probably be something about Ray William Johnson. But if you're watching, DM me, all right? I'm not fucking coward. I may be younger than you, but I actually have some sense in my fucking head about this shit. I mean, if you don't like the video, I'm sorry. Plenty of people you probably made fun of didn't like your video. I mean, just DM me if you fucking see this. We can talk it through. That same day, Hoover also disputed the claim, asking Ray or his company to let go of the claim because a mistake had been made. After all, Hoover's entire video was claimed. The entire video is not Ray's property. It's believed that Ray downloaded Hoover's video, re-uploaded it, put it into the claim system, then took it down that way. Beyond copyright, there is a discrepancy here. And what you do next in this situation is escalated by challenging Ray's claim saying that either remove the claim or give me a channel strike. And if you do give me that strike, I'll send a counter notice so you'll have to sue me to keep that video down. Now on day three of this event, E3 Inc, Ray's company, held the claim. So now alongside having his video down, there was now also a strike on his channel. At this point, large channels like Keemstar were joining the mob against Ray William Johnson. Keemstar tweeting at Ray asking if and why he would take Hoover's video down. But two days later, on January 5th, four days after the video was taken down, E3 Inc., after being directly emailed by Hoover, released the claim. Something that if they wanted to avoid bad PR, should have done sooner. As if the purpose of releasing the claim was to staunch the flow of hate towards Ray, Sure, it stopped it from becoming as big as it could have, but it did not stop it from escalating. Because the same day the claim was released, Quiet, a large channel, covered the story and denounced Ray for taking the video down in the first place. Six days later, on the 11th, 
PewDiePie covered it, introducing a little over 9 million people to raise copyright abuse. Now this is at surface level where most people stop paying attention to Ray and his copyright abuse. It seems to be a one-off situation that was resolved in 4 days time. Ray doesn't seem to have a history of this, so why meditate on it? But it turns out, he does. And that is just the start of this deep dive. Because as the few that kept investigating Ray found, there is a very long and strange trail of videos being taken down by Ray. Even after the Hoover situation, it kept on happening. The major difference was that Hoover had a voice so he could easily spread information about Ray's copyright abuse to public forums. Ray's other victims, smaller channels, were not so lucky. So far, as we know, this dates all the way back to June 2013 when a channel known as RWJ without RWJ was gaining some relevance. As the name suggests, the owner of this channel stripped Equals 3's videos down to just the viral videos with no inclusion of Ray, which just makes it a compilation of random viral videos. Within days, the channel grew in subs, but decreased in videos. As to why that is, its only video before its termination titled Ray William Johnson, a hypocrite, gives us a bit of insight as it shows us that four of their videos were hit with copyright strikes by the owner of RayWilliamJohnson at gmail.com. Where this gets a bit strange is that two years prior, in a seemingly unrelated event, Ray, while addressing other emails, stated that RayWilliamJohnson.com was not his email. So then, who took the videos down? It could be someone that was impersonating Ray, this reinforced also by the method of the takedown. As usually, whenever there is an infringing property, the copyright system needs a reference to the original so it can verify that the content is being stolen. But as Ray, nor his work, was included in the video, a takedown shouldn't have been possible. Well that is, if you are following the rules. What is thought to have happened is that according to this image of a copyright claim, one of RWJ with RWJ's videos was taken down due to it being a copy of a video with the exact same name. But how could that have even been possible if that was the original video? The answer is that Ray, like he did with Hoover, downloaded the entire video, uploaded it to his channel but made it private solely to place it into the content ID system allowing him to take down the other video by making it look like his was the original. So this was most likely the method used to take down enough videos until RWJ without RWJ was banned due to accumulating too many copyright strikes. While a few YouTube videos and forum posts were made denouncing Ray for abusing the copyright system, this copyright abuse was mostly forgotten. But it doesn't end there, as Ray's next targets for copyright strikes were even more obscure than the last. In 2015, it was the YouTube Poop music video community that was being struck. To explain what that amalgam of wars is, we'll start by breaking it down. A YouTube Poop is what some today might consider a shitpost, but in video form. It takes the source material and generally amplifies it and transforms aspects about it to make it more comedic or entertaining. When done in music form, it's a YouTube Poop music video, or YTPMV. Because of their transformative nature, it's arguable that these tend to fall under fair use. Look up any popular content creator and you'll most likely find a list of YTPMVs sampled by their older footage. Ray was no exception, as he had a long list of his own. The most popular being the YTPMV, Rock My Forum. Its popularity back then was largely due to the fact that the song itself was sampled in other YTPMVs. But now, it's popular for a different reason. Not because of how well it's made or how catchy the song is, but because Ray, like many YTPMVs, took it down in 2015 while strangely enough targeting that community and any channel that dared use his footage in that format. One of, if not the most prominent channel, was Vaver. A Selva Gunna parody channel that by uploading footage that sourced Rock My Forum received three copyright strikes, meaning that that channel would have been banned if the strikes were not appealed, which they were. Due to the Streisand effect, members of the YTPMV community struck back by re-uploading Rock My Forum in protest. 
but that did little to stop Ray's copyright rampage as many of these were taken down and the related channels subsequently received copyright strikes, leading many to remove any reference of Ray from their channel to avoid even more strikes, so this fear of Ray's copyright abuse did work as a deterrent. But is it even Ray or is it a troll? Well, the consistency of these strikes is jarring as they are either from 3 Inc. or 3 Studios. The person as written but not confirmed is Ray William Johnson, and the email is raywilliamjohnson at gmail.com, and email Ray several years back said that wasn't his. That changed three years later in 2018 when Vaver reached out to Ben, who is a trusted flagger meant to resolve issues within the YouTube community and is therefore a community moderator appointed by YouTube. Such a title allows access to certain account information, like if an email is linked to a channel, which was the question posed by Vaver and confirmed by Ben that raywilliamjohnson at gmail.com was in fact the email linked to Ray's channel. This practically verified that the strikes are coming from Ray's channel and or company. But before we touch on that, there are still many more victims of Ray's copyright abuse like a channel known as Flitter Flutter that was terminated due to too many copyright strikes and is now running a channel known as Ashley, who openly opposes Ray and is also source for much of this information. Which brings us to where we are now in 2019. Shortly after the Hoover situation where Ray struck someone that was too big, which is typically when these sorts of things stop as content creators get called out for their behavior and make attempts to avoid future controversies. Though Ray did learn from it, just not in the way you think. Since the Hoover incident, he has not copyright struck any prominent video made on him, but he has continued his campaign of striking smaller channels that don't have the power to get large scale attention. Actually, right after the Hoover situation, he continued his striking campaign on the YTPMB community like nothing ever happened. He even started to expand beyond there by blocking a Let's Play video that used some of his new music. And this is where we get into the difference of automated striking and manual striking. Automated striking usually happens when you upload a video and it notifies you that some of the content that you're using is actively being protected by copyright and that you should remove it from your video which is most likely the case for some YTPMVs and that specific Let's Play. Which is, in content creator terms, rather innocent. Some content creators do this to deter whole re-uploads of the content, which is normal. It's when it's done manually and it's targeted to silence content that seemingly falls under fair use that it's looked down upon. Now for this part, I, June the King, reached out to several content creators asking about their experience with Ray's copyright abuse as it all seems very strange and inconsistent. First, I reached out to Turkey Tom and Just Jargon who collaborated and compiled much of this in their very detailed video, Ray William Johnson's Copyright Abuse. From here, they gave me more sources like Ashley, a member of the YTPMV community who gave me many screenshots of the copyright claims many of which the source video that exists on Ray's channel had strange names like video file number A24, TT video number 202, or doing your mom happening forum zone, none of which by our knowledge have ever existed on Ray's channel publicly. That and their strange names further solidify Ray's re-uploading technique. I also reached out to Flipgraph, which had his video, Ray William Johnson's Sketches Are Garbage, taken down the same way, but was randomly released later. You like my video? I think it has some good points, as well as some good jokes. But Ray William Johnson did not think the same. He blocked my video with his copy strike claim. That's when it gets a bit weirder. Why claim a video, then release it unprompted? Again, looking at different claims also shows that it's being claimed by two companies. E3 Inc. and E Studios, which of course are both equals three studios, but then why not just stick to one name? Also, there are two different emails used from time to time, like raywilliamjohnson at gmail.com that we're familiar with and also raywjbusiness at gmail.com. Why not just claim it under one company and one email? Another prominent non-YouTube poop video that was taken down is known as Capital Gangsta The Untold Story of Ray William Johnson's First Show, Retro King Ching Episode 1. This video documents Ray's early endeavors in an arguably good light. As mentioned early in the video, Retro King Ching was actually a friend of Ray's who collaborated with him when Retro was running his old channel for Fun 808. 
They were so close that for VidCon 07, 08, and 09, Retro King Ching stayed at Ray's apartment during the events. He even collaborated with him on an early Equals 3 video. But when Ray grew in size, Ray suddenly stopped communication, and about 10 years later, when Retro released his video in 2020, it was taken down. This shows two more things that add to the confusion of it all. First is, why would Ray take down an old friend's video that shined a positive light on him? Wasn't Ray just targeting negative videos? Also, his copyright dispute further implies that it is most likely not Ray who's taking down these videos, because to dispute it and keep the video down, this is what was written. Quote, the video in question does indeed infringe on my client's copyrighted work. The infringing party also did not transform the work in any kind of visible way, and their re-upload of our work is not protected under current U.S. copyright law." Unquote. While we can address that this was submitted on Ray's behalf by a person who goes by Rob, whose last name won't be disclosed to potentially protect their identity. Regardless, the way that it is written and the writer's ignorance of Ray's old content and how easy it is to obtain means it probably was not Ray who wrote this as Ray has actually had legal battles dealing with copyright and has most likely studied copyright far beyond the average content creator's understanding. So the potential for Ray to write ignorant claims like, quote, the infringing party also did not transform the work in any kind of visible way, unquote, on a documentary that included original observations and insight is not very reasonable, which again opens the possibility that someone else is doing this on Ray's behalf. Another interesting piece of information that was uncovered during my interview with Retro King Ching is that he also confirmed that Ray's email even prior to 2011, when he denied it in this tweet, was raywilliamjohnson at gmail.com. Yeah, it's 100% his. I have, I still have all the emails saved. Every email I've ever sent to him, I have it saved. And I even have emails of him writing back to me, and it has a signature array and everything. And it has the Equals 3 logo. Uh, it, it has everything. This is him. That's 100% him. He even forwarded me their all communications as proof. But to give the benefit of the doubt, that tweet of Ray saying that that isn't his email could very well be fake as the only source is Zarlable, another victim of Ray's copyright abuse. Normally, you could just check a person's old tweets, but Ray deleted all his old tweets, and the Wayback Machine doesn't have it archived for that date. But if that screenshot is real, why would Ray even lie about it back then? Why target such inconsistent forms of content? We know for certain that it's Ray's channel taking down these videos, but is it Ray or is it an employee? And that's the issue with this entire thing. It's a lack of communication from Ray. Even when he was called out by PewDiePie and Keemstar, there was no acknowledgement of these takedowns. But Ray has said in the past that he is non-confrontational and avoids drama. But in this case, as it usually happens, silence leads to a sign of guilt. As far as we know, there have been no manual takedowns in 2021. And even if it was not him and a company representing him taking these videos down, many agree that it is still Ray's responsibility to direct these claims to those actually guilty of copyright infringement rather than videos that fall under fair use like music videos sampling his footage or videos that clearly criticize him. It's this silence and lack of addressing nearly anything that can be categorized as internet drama that ruins Ray William Johnson for many. If he was really trying to change, transparency, like a reason for his takedowns, should be on the top of his list. As there is an internal conflict when Ray says that he's changing to maintain relationships and avoid burning bridges when these actions prove otherwise, at least in the YouTube environment, which he most likely cares less for. So what I did was I started working on myself. I started working on myself. I started working on every relationship that I had. I started being more outgoing and forthcoming with my feelings, especially the positive ones, like telling people, hey, man, I think you're doing really great. I think you're going to make it. You know what I'm saying? Doing that kind of stuff. And really getting into like self-development and, and self-improvement on myself because I firmly believe that you got to work on yourself before you can really help anyone else. So I've been on that journey. So my idea was I was going to make this brand and this brand was going to represent helping people and helping yourself. Somehow, somehow I'm going to make that work. As for where Ray is now, he went from rehashing his older content to its new forms, all the way to the point to where he went full circle and is back at reacting to viral videos via TikTok and YouTube. 
a content form where he saw large-scale success in, but abandoned a little after its peak, is now something he's doing again. Some can point to the lack of success of his other endeavors as a return to what worked, so there is both a positive and negative perspective to be taken with this. The negative is that he sought larger goals outside of this medium and attempted to find large-scale success in acting and other art forms, but could not realize it fully, so he had to go back to what worked for him initially, which is something he lost passion for a long time ago. The positive perspective is that there is much unknown about Ray currently, and he is most likely living comfortably posting these short videos on several media platforms at once, as Ray has achieved more than what an extremely large majority of content creators can lay claim to. Being number one on the most popular video sharing website is quite the achievement, and now that it's been done, there is little left to prove. But if Ray wants to successfully rebrand himself as a friendlier entertainer out to help people, like he mentioned when being interviewed by Logan Paul, then his rampant abuse of the copyright system is a massive hindrance that will follow him through his new projects. No matter how well he does or how much he has changed other aspects about himself, every new video hit with acclaim, every video taken down, and every time he ignores his copyright abuse, it will open the same wounds and have these stories covered over and over until he has addressed it or left the internet. But with Ray's persistence, with being one of the longest running content creators on the platform, there is still much time to unravel the mystery of his copyright takedowns and for Ray to give the answer to that one burning question, why? Regardless, whether you choose to remember Ray as the host of Viral Clip Show or for his love of taking down videos, it is undeniable that he put a lot of work to get to where he is today. From a broke college student working out of his apartment turned ex-king of YouTube, he has come a long way. And it is advisable that if he wishes to continue on his positive, self-changing journey, that he avoids any more scandalous activities. But to that, we'll leave to time.